on World News Tonight. Power Pack. Albanese meets with UK Prime Minister ahead of submarine deal unveiling. Approaching brickmanship. North Korea fires submarine launch missiles ahead of Freedom Shield exercise. Take on Trump. Former US Vice President takes a big swing at Trump, accusing him for endangering his family. And the Oscars 2023. The Academy Awards unfolded at the Dolby Theatre in Los Angeles with a many winning days. is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening and you are joining us on World News this Monday night. Now leading tonight is on the trilateral security pact between Australia, the United Kingdom and the United States. Britain's Prime Minister Rishi Sunak met his Australian counterpart in San Diego ahead of a meeting to announce a way forward for Australia to receive nuclear-powered submarines in Canberra's biggest ever defence project. The countries, along with the United States, announced the so-called AUKUS plan in 2021 as part of efforts to counter China in the Indo-Pacific region. However, questions remain over strict U.S. curbs on the extensive technology sharing needed for the project and about the length of time it will take to deliver the submarines. Australia is expected to buy up to five U.S. Virginia-class nuclear-powered submarines in the 2030s as part of the landmark agreement to be revealed in detail by Biden, Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese and British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. A record-breaking flood in Australia's Queensland state was forecast to peak after almost 100 residents of an outback town were moved to higher ground. The flood triggered by heavy rain over the past week, about 1,300 miles northwest of the state capital, Brisbane. Dan McKinley, chief executive of the local council responsible for Burke Town, said that 97 residents had been airlifted out in the past 48 hours. Australia's Bureau of Meteorology predicted water levels in the area would peak. It said the flood had already topped a March 2011 record of 22.2 feet. The crisis comes after frequent flooding in Australia's east over the last two years due to a multi-year La Nina weather event, including once-in-a-century floods that hit remote areas in the neighbouring Northern Territory in January. Now over in China, with his annual National People's Congress coming to an end, Chinese President Xi Jinping has officially launched his unprecedented third term in office. Now the country's most powerful leader, Xi has vowed to do his best to prove worthy of the country's trust. The annual session of China's rubber stamp parliament, the National People's Congress, that kicked off on March 5th, came to a close on Monday. The closing ceremony was held at Beijing's Great Hall of the People, beginning at 9 a.m. local time. One major achievement from the session was the endorsement of Xi Jinping's unprecedented third term as China's president. On Friday, Congress unanimously voted to endorse Xi's third term, making him the longest-serving head of the state since its founding in 1949. President Xi delivered a speech at the closing ceremony where he said that the people's trust is the biggest motivation that drives him to march on. Xi said that he will faithfully fulfill his responsibilities bestowed by the Constitution with the nation's needs as his mission and the people's interest as his yardstick. There was also a leadership reshuffle for the central government. Li Shang, one of Xi's most trusted protégés, was chosen as China's new premier on Saturday. On Monday morning, Li held a press conference to discuss future plans regarding the economy. Other senior appointments include four new vice premiers who will work to revive China's economy after three years of strict zero-COVID restrictions. The NPC also approved a plan to reform institutions under the state council, including the formation of a financial regulatory body and national data bureau, as well as a revamp of its science and technology ministry. The changes are seen as a further step by Xi to strengthen control over key areas of policy making. Now on to the surprising announcement by Saudi Arabia and Iran, who have agreed to re-establish diplomatic relations after seven years of hostility. The South Korean government has welcomed the agreement, saying it will contribute to peace of the Middle East. On Sunday, the South Korean government welcomed the good news of Saudi Arabia and Iran resuming diplomatic relations. South Korea's foreign minister said that Seoul hopes this agreement will enhance trust between the two countries and alleviate tensions in the region. 
An agreement brokered by China was signed on Friday by Saudi Arabian National Security Advisor Musaid bin Mohammed Al Ayban and Iran's top security official Ali Shamkhani. After four days of previously undisclosed talks in Beijing, the two Middle Eastern powers agreed to reactivate a 2001 security cooperation accord, as well as another earlier pact on trade, economy and investment. The two countries have long been at odds, with Saudi Arabia as the leading Sunni Muslim power and Iran the leading Shiite Muslim power. While the two have backed opposite sides in proxy wars throughout history, the recent hostility between the two countries has threatened stability and security in the Gulf and has been fueling conflicts in the region. Friday's deal resumes diplomacy between the two countries. Saudi Arabia had cut ties with Iran in 2016 amid a dispute over Riyadh's execution of a Shiite Muslim cleric, with Iran storming the Saudi embassy in Tehran in retaliation. Then in 2019, Saudi Arabia blamed Iran for missile and drone attacks on its oil facilities, as well as attacks on tankers in Gulf waters, charges which Iran has denied. Analysts say Friday's agreement should de-escalate tensions in the region, which includes affirmation of the two countries' respect for the sovereignty of states and the non-interference in internal affairs, with an agreement to reopen embassies in both countries within two months. And for China, their top diplomat Wang Yi highlighted Beijing's role in achieving the successful deal for dialogue and peace, adding that it would continue to play a constructive role in addressing tough global issues. Seoul and Washington have kicked off their Freedom Shield military exercise today, and North Korea fired at least one submarine launched missile in apparent protest. North Korea has fired at least one missile from a submarine in the peninsula's East Sea according to South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff this morning. The South's military are yet to release further details, but according to the North state-run Korea Central News Agency, North Korea at dawn on Sunday fired two strategic cruise missiles from its submarine named the 824 Hero Sub, while conducting an underwater drill in the East Sea. The news agency said the drill was supposed to test weapon reliability and the submarine unit's attack form above and underwater. It reported that its mission was a success. The North said the two missiles traveled in 1,500-kilometer figure of eight-shaped flight orbits, taking a little more than 7,560 seconds to directly hit their target. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff are investigating to verify the claims. If confirmed, this would be the first case of North Korea successfully launching a cruise missile from a submarine. It would also mean that the missile could potentially reach as far as the U.S. Army base in Japan's Okinawa. This missile launch comes on the eve of the Allies' largest combined military exercise in five years, dubbed the Freedom Shield. Since 2018, large-scale live field training has been scaled back or called off, first to foster diplomacy with North Korea and then to fend off COVID-19 infections. But now it's back, and for 11 days, marking the longest combined training course for the Allies ever. The drills are supposed to enhance combat readiness and defense posture by conducting extensive field training exercises on the Korean Peninsula under the name Warrior Shield. North Korea's Ministry of Foreign Affairs on Monday issued a statement that mentions this joint drill and says that it will respond strongly to the U.S. and its followers, quote, hostile scheming. An expert has noted that North Korea's recent missile launch appears to be a clear warning message from North Korea as it puts the entire Korean peninsula within range. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, all eyes are on what's next following the collapse of the Silicon Valley Bank. Following the dramatic failure of SVB, the U.S. government has decided to step in to guarantee all deposits at the bank. This comes as the government and regulators spent all weekend seeking ways to minimize the damage and fear brought on by the collapse of the 16th largest bank in the nation. Queues were seen outside a First Republic Bank branch in California on Saturday, with worried customers wanting to withdraw funds after the sudden collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. Startup-focused lender SVB Financial Group on Friday became the largest bank to fail since the 2008 financial crisis. 
It's worrying some analysts and prominent investors who warned on Saturday that without a resolution by Monday, other banks could come under pressure if people worried about their deposits. Media reports on Saturday said U.S. financial authorities were racing to contain the fallout of the collapse, with Bloomberg News saying the Federal Reserve and Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, or FDIC, were weighing the creation of a fund that would allow regulators to backstop more deposits at banks that run into trouble. According to the report, regulators discussed the so-called new special vehicle with banking executives in hopes that such a measure would reassure depositors and help stem any panic. The Federal Reserve declined to comment on the report, while FDIC did not immediately respond to a request for comment. The White House said earlier on Saturday that President Joe Biden had spoken with California Governor Gavin Newsom about efforts to address the issue, but did not give details. In a statement, Newsom said, everyone is working with FDIC to stabilize the situation as quickly as possible. This comes as SVB's downward spiral was kicked off by a warning from Moody's that it was preparing to downgrade the bank's credit rating just days before it imploded. And it was its failed response to the prospect of the downgrade that eventually led to the two-day run on the bank. That wiped out more than $100 billion in market value for U.S. banks before regulators stepped in on Friday and put the bank in receivership. There were new comments from former U.S. Vice President Mike Pence about former U.S. President Donald Trump. Pence says that his boss was reckless and suggesting Trump put him and his family in danger during the attack on the Capitol. Former U.S. Vice President Mike Pence offered his most forceful rebuke to date of his one-time boss, Donald Trump, saying that history will hold him accountable for his role in the January 6, 2021 attack on the U.S. Capitol. On Saturday night, Pence told assembled journalists and their guests at the Gridiron Dinner, an annual white tie event in Washington, D.C., that President Trump was wrong, adding, quote, I had no right to overturn the election and his reckless words endangered my family and everyone at the Capitol that day. Pence was in the Capitol when thousands of Trump supporters breached the building in an attempt to stop Congress from certifying the results of the 2020 presidential election, which Trump lost to Joe Biden. Throughout the siege, Trump sent out several tweets, one calling on Republicans to fight and others making false claims of voter fraud. He also criticized Pence for certifying the results. Pence, who was whisked to safety by law enforcement during the attack, is now considering a run for the Republican nomination for the 2024 presidential election. He would be up against Trump, who has already thrown his hat back into the ring. In the months following the incident, Pence rarely addressed January 6, but has since upped his criticism of the rioters and the behavior of his former boss that day. His remarks Saturday came just days after conservative television host Tucker Carlson aired security footage of the Capitol attack, claiming that many of the rioters were orderly, a depiction that was sharply criticized by Democrats and several high-profile Republicans in the Senate. Japan marked the 12th anniversary of the massive earthquake, tsunami and nuclear disaster with a minute of silence. As concerns grew ahead of the planned release of the treated radioactive water from the wrecked Fukushima nuclear plant and the government's return to nuclear energy. Japan marked the 12-year anniversary of the 2011 Fukushima disaster on Saturday. The deadly earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear disaster that claimed the lives of over 20,000 people and took thousands of homes rendered uninhabitable by radiation. In Fukushima, Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida took part in a minute's silence to remember those who died. <laughs> Mourners were seen laying flowers in Hisanahama, a village around 18 miles south of the ruined Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power station. The grief doesn't change, says mourner Yuki Kajimi, who traveled to Hisanahama from Sendai. I've been constantly living with sorrow ever since that day. The Japanese public remains wary of nuclear power after the 2011 earthquake and tsunami caused explosions and meltdowns at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear station. There are now just five nuclear power plants operating in the country, down from about 50 before the disaster. 
Now, France's Senate has voted to approve a deeply unpopular reform to pensions, hours after demonstrators took to the streets again to oppose the cornerstone policy of Emmanuel Macron's second presidential term. The French Senate on Saturday night adopted President Emmanuel Macron's unpopular pension reform plan. That in the wake of a seventh day of demonstrations that were not as large as authorities had expected. 195 members of the French Parliament's upper house voted for the text, whose key measure is raising the retirement age by two years to 64. 112 voted against. The protests and rolling strikes that have affected refineries, public transport and garbage collections aim to pressure the government to withdraw the pension plan. But the government believes the change is essential to ensure the pension system does not run out of money. Now that the Senate has adopted the bill, it will be reviewed by a joint committee of lower and upper house lawmakers, likely on Wednesday, when an additional day of nationwide strikes and protests are planned. Providing the committee agrees on a text, a final vote in both chambers will take place. If the government fears it won't have enough votes in the lower house, where Macron's party still needs allies' votes for a majority, it's still possible they could push the text through without a parliamentary vote. Welcome back. The famous carpet changed colour in Hollywood for this year's Oscars. It was described as champagne instead of being the traditional red. But the glamour on the show was the same as ever. It was a night of historic wins at the 95th Annual Academy Award, taking place at the Dolby Theatre in Los Angeles, California. This year's host, the infamous Jimmy Kimmel, opened the night with a Top Gun Maverick skit, pretending to parachute in and welcome the nominees in the audience and their films being seen, quote, unquote, the way you intended them to be seen in a theatre. Before making jokes about Ozempic, Steven Spielberg, Babylon's underwhelming box office and diversity. And the Oscar goes to everything, everywhere, all at once. Everything, everywhere, all at once won the coveted Best Picture trophy at the Academy Awards on Sunday as Hollywood embraced an off-kilter story about a Chinese-American family working out their problems across multiple dimensions. And the Oscar goes to Michelle Yeoh. Michelle Yeoh has become only the second woman of color to win the Best Actress Oscar following in the footsteps of Halle Berry back in 2002. The Daniels, writer-directors Daniel Kwan and Daniel Scheinert are only the third duo ever to win the Oscar for Best Director. Scheiner said that they want to dedicate this to the mummies. He also spoke about dressing in drag as a kid, quote, which is a threat to nobody, in reference to a rise in anti-drag sentiment in recent months. And the Oscar goes to Brendan Fraser. The Whale. Best actor went to Brendan Fraser for his lead role in The Whale, beating out Austin Butler and Corin Farrell. He thanked director Darren Aronofsky for throwing him a creative lifeline after years of minor roles. The divisive drama also won for best makeup and hairstyling despite pushback against a suit created to make Frasier look like he weighed 600 pounds. All right. Are you guys ready? Ooh. R R R. R R R. The song Natu Natu from the hit Telugu language film RRR has made history by becoming the first Indian film song to win an Oscar. The blockbuster track won Best Original Song at the 95th Academy Awards, beating heavyweights like Lady Gaga and Rihanna. Its catchy tempo and choreography has captivated audiences around the world. India won a second Oscar for The Elephant Whisperers, which won in the Best Documentary Short Film category. The Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences hoped to move past the slap and stage a glitzy show and boost sagging TV ratings. Ahead of the awards, nominees dressed in designer gowns and tuxedos touted their movies on a champagne carpet in place of the traditional red. Winners are voted on by the roughly 10,000 actors, producers, directors and film craftspeople who make up the Film Academy. And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. 
In case you missed any of the stories tonight, you can always watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other than English. Now we leave you tonight with these spectacular performances by Rihanna delivering a much anticipated performance of Lift Me Up and Lady Gaga singing her original song from Top Gun Maverick at the Oscars ceremony. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.